Well, good morning. Let me um, start out with, uh, we have 30 minutes, uh, and I probably need to explain to you one of the most uh, disruptive and probably hyped concepts uh, we have seen in, in any industry for quite a bit of time. Um, very quick show of hands before we get into, uh, into it. Um, who has participated in an ICO, an initial coin offering? Wow, one person, two persons. Okay, good. Uh, who, ha who has or holds um, crypto assets? Uh, Bitcoin, that kind of stuff. All right. And who thinks he actually understands the blockchain? <laughs> okay. Right. So what I'm going to do is fantastic. You know, fantastic. So what we're going to do is I want to tell you a little bit about what the blockchain actually is. We'll talk a bit about cryptocurrencies. I'll touch lightly on ICOs, on uh, initial coin offerings. Um, and we'll do this in three ways. First, I'm going to give you the 101. So my aim is for you to walk out of here to have a decent understanding of what this whole thing is about. And then the second part is we are going to debunk a whole bunch of the, bunch of the myth and the hype around this. Um, and then I'm showing you why it still is probably one of the more disruptive technologies we've seen in our, in our lifetime. And before we get there, I want to uh, take you back to um, the 31st of October 2008. Who knows which monumental, life-changing event happened on this day? Any ideas? Really? Come on, this is a talk about blockchain. You need to know some of that stuff. All right, so let me tell you, uh, we bought this horse. This is my wife with my horse. Um, probably more important, this is literally on this day. Uh, probably more importantly, a, uh, a person uh, called Satoshi Nakamoto published a white paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Um, this uh, white paper, I highly recommend, it's only nine pages long, describes a decentralized cryptocurrency based on a new protocol, a new software called the blockchain. And here's the first uh, interesting insight into this. Um, said person, Satoshi Nak uh, Nakamoto, um, this is Satoshi Nakamoto, um, a L.A. resident um, by the name Satoshi Nakamoto, who, by the way, is not the inventor of blockchain because we don't know who invented the blockchain um, or Bitcoin. Um, there's an uh, Australian entrepreneur who claimed he is the uh, inventor of the blockchain. Um, by the way, if you ever see someone coming up out of like a mysterious new technology being founded by a mysterious new entity called Satoshi Nakamoto, and someone comes up and says, I am that person, it's most likely a fraud. And then some people say, this was actually invented by the Russians to destabilize the world economy. So we see, and here's an interesting insight in this, which is one of the most disruptive technologies comes from a person or a group of people we don't know. Like, nobody knows who is actually this person or group of people. A lot of people say it's actually a group of people, but we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. I want to do a tiny, uh, what we call in the, in the US a 101. Like, when you go into the US in your college, like your first college class on any subject is called the 101. And the first really important point to understand, a lot of people don't get this, is the differentiation between Bitcoin and the blockchain. The blockchain is a piece of technology, which I will explain to you uh, in just a few minutes, on how this whole thing works. The Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency implementation of the blockchain. In this white paper, which you just saw from Satoshi, he describes both. He describes this idea of a new peer-to-peer -peer currency, which is based on this new technology. But these are two different concepts, so we'll explore those in, in more detail. And Quite frankly, if you forget everything, everything I tell you, just make one note. What blockchain does to you is it makes trust obsolete. And if you think about the impact that has, all our lives, all our interactions, all our transactions, and the vast amount of your industry, and many other industries, by the way, such as supply chain, for example, is based on the idea of trust. Either implicit, I trust you that we can make a transaction, I trust that 10 US dollars is worth anything, or explicit, where I pay money to establish the trust. I go to a notary to establish trust, I go to a bank to establish trust, etc. The Economist calls this the trust machine. It's a great article, I highly recommend this. So let's talk about blockchain. Again, blockchain is the underlying technology of all this. 
important to understand, I get this, I, a lot of people get this wrong. They think there is a blockchain, like the internet. We are all on the same internet. Whereas blockchain is actually blockchains. There's a gazillion of these blockchains. Blockchain itself is a technology protocol which establishes transaction in a trustless system, in a peer-to-peer -peer trustless system. What this means is this. Today, if you want to store any type of information, let's say a transaction, um, or even storing a picture, what you do is you use a centralized approach. You have a piece of information and you store it in a database. If you then replicate this database onto the edge, which we call, for example, cloud computing, um, you get to a um, distributed system. What blockchain does is, and this is uh, uh, the, the real interesting part is, it decentralizes this. The way this works is very simple. This is like the simplest explanation I can give you. You take a piece of information, and then there's a, um, a crypt uh, cryptography, some math, some complex math, which basically takes the, the digital information and creates a fingerprint of it which is unique to this file. So I give a file, I run some math on it, it creates a fingerprint. What the blockchain now does is, in its most simplest form is, now if I add a transaction to this ledger, what I'm doing is I'm taking the hash, it's called the hash, the, the fingerprint, and I put it underneath my uh, new transaction. So I have a, uh, a chain, I link these two together, and then I create a new hash for the original new document, as well as the old information. What you create, though, is with that is you create the chain. So you've got blocks on the chain, which is the individual transaction with the cryptography underneath it, and then you link them together. And what this means is that once you have this established, I cannot make changes to that chain. Because if I were to make a change somewhere in the middle of that chain, I break the chain because these hashes, these, uh, these little fingerprints, don't add up anymore. So this prevents Enron. Very simply speaking, in accounting terms, this prevents Enron. I can't go back into my books and fudge my books. It gets a little bit more complex. There's something called the Merkle tree, where what we're doing on the, on the, in the Bitcoin blockchain is actually we're not just looking at the last transaction and putting like the fingerprint from the last transaction into our new transaction. We're looking at a kind of like a complex math of all the transactions that were before and put that into our, into our new block. Again, this establishes trust in a world where uh, trust is expensive. This creates security. I mentioned to you, you can't change the blockchain. It's impossible to go into the blockchain and just like remove one of these blocks or change one of these blocks because you break the whole chain which comes afterwards. And because the system is decentralized, this means we're sending copies of this whole blockchain to many, many computers, which now can verify and can say, hey, there is a change in the blockchain over here, but 50 other copies of the blockchain aren't changed. So we have a consensus behind this, saying that if 50 of those aren't changed and this one is changed, this must be fudged, this must be illegal. Right? So we create a really interesting um, safe system. There's a wonderful video, it's like, I love this, this was uh, on the John Oliver show, so if you're watching the, uh, the Last Week Tonight show, which is the best show on US television by far, um, they found a clip to explain how trust security on the blockchain works. And uh, let me just quickly play this for you. The way I like to think of it is that a, a blockchain is a highly processed thing, sort of like a chicken McNugget. And if you wanted to hack it, it'd be like turning a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now, someday someone will be able to do that, but for now, it's going to be tough. So first of all, I love the, uh, the moderator's face when he was like, talking about the chicken McNugget. He's just like, what? But it's true. What you do is you take effectively these little pieces um, and process them to an extent that it's impossible to like, reconstruct them. So you create a highly secure system. The second thing you solve with the blockchain, and this is unique in digital assets, is you solve what is called the double spending problem. The double spending problem is in uh, cryptocurrencies, for example, before the blockchain, it is very hard to establish that if I give you a crypto asset, let's say I give you a coin, 
and then I give the same coin to a second person, it is really hard to establish who owns the original, who owns the actual coin, and who owns just a mere copy of the coin. The blockchain, by the fact that you have this um, consent algorithm behind it, where you have the majority of the network needs to approve that this coin was a true transaction, you solve for this problem. It's a really big asset. So that's the blockchain. On top of the blockchain, we then build cryptocurrencies. So these are digital currency assets. And the first version of a cryptocurrency, of course, was the actual Bitcoin. This is the thing which was described in the paper. Bitcoin today is about 140 billion US dollars worth in circulation. So people actually store value in this and believe in it to a certain extent. An interesting aspect of Bitcoin is that Bitcoin, by the way the algorithm is written, by the way the software is written, there can only be 21 million coins in circulation in total in eternity. So what we do is we create new coins. There's a process called mining, which creates new coins. But it tops out at 21 million coins, which if you're an economist, and I was a you know, back in the day, I was a trained economist. It creates an interesting asset, which is we're creating an economy which is um, deflationary because we cannot print money. This is another interesting aspect of this, which is different than like a normal fi fiat currency where like the US um, uh, uh, Central Bank, for example, can print dollars if they want to print dollars. You cannot mint more coins than these 21 million coins. Uh, and of course, it leads to these weird... Uh, fluctuations currently, right? This is a very common joke. A boy asks his uh, Bitcoin investing dad for one Bitcoin, and the dad says, like, what? 15,000? What do you need $15,544 for? $14,000 is a lot you, you, uh, to keep, etc. The Bitcoin is highly fluctuating, like highly um, volatile at the moment. But then something interesting happened to the crypto community. We came to a version 2 of crypto assets. This is like weird uh, programmer guy called Vitalik Buterin. Uh, and Vitalik, um, this is his official about page. Uh, Vitalik might very well be the person who is upending a good chunk of the way we think about currency and the way we think about um, asset management. Um, it's a pretty remarkable f uh, feat for a kid who literally on his website wrote, um, I was playing the game of Warcraft, and one day I realized that Blizzard changed something in the code, and I realized that centralized systems are doomed. So I went out and wrote a new cryptocurrency. So in November 2013, Vitalik um, wrote and released a piece of software called Ethereum. Ethereum at its core is a cryptocurrency, but what Ethereum allows you to do is, it allows you to attach code, software code, to your cryptocurrency. What this does is you can create what is called smart contracts. A smart contract is nothing else if, uh, if you use a subscription service today, if you've got a magazine or something, and uh, you allow them to pull out money out of your bank account every month when the magazine comes, that's a smart contract. Like every month, automatically, the magazine basically pulls money out of your account. Now I can take an, a digital asset and attach software code to it. I can do stuff like, if I'm selling this to you, and you confirm that it's arrived at your location, automatically I will get paid. And this uh, creates really interesting business opportunities, particular in uh, areas like the, um, the supply chain, but also asset management. And we'll get there in a minute. And then very lastly, let's talk about what is called ICO, so initial coin offerings. ICOs come in two flavors. The one is the more traditional version where you attach an equity, like an equity stake in a startup, for example, to a coin. So it's nothing else than basically using a token, a coin, a digital asset, as a representation of my equity stake. And then I can, uh, I can trade them, a little bit like stock. The other way is to think about ICOs, and a lot of ICOs are what we call utility tokens. The easiest way to think about this is if I open a coin laundry, and I go out, and before I start my coin laundry, I say, I, I mint a million of these coins for my coin laundry, and now I'm selling them on the market before my coin laundry even started. And you buy them, you buy this token. Now I have an economy of these tokens out there, because you can choose to use them in my coin laundry, but you can also trade them with other people, so I create a marketplace for it. That's literally, essentially, what an ICO is. So here's your summary. This is just like the key takeaways for the blockchain. There's a couple of just 
core assets you need to understand. The blockchain is unchangeable, and it has a full history of all transactions which have happened. And it's unchangeable because it's cryptography-driven uh, security in there. I cannot change it. If I, even if I want to, and even if I bribe someone, I cannot change it. It is shared among many parties, and that basically distributes trust out of a single system. It has a consensus mechanism behind it, which means that the vast majority of the network needs to say, I believe this transaction to be true, and otherwise it is not true. And then you can traditionally, additionally can create these smart contracts. That's not true for all assets, not all blockchains, um, but increasingly is this true for many of them. So let's debunk a little bit the hype. So first of all, there's a sheer madness we have currently in the market, and I'm pretty sure you heard about this. Let's start with this. This is the first item which was ever being bought using uh, Bitcoin. Uh, literally a pizza from a place called uh, Papa, uh, sorry, I think it was Papa John's. Papa John's, if you're from the US, is a pretty mediocre pizza place. And the programmers basically went online and said, I give 10,000 Bitcoins to the person who delivers me a Papa John's. And some kid basically said, like, oh, okay, I go to Papa John's and deliver you 10,000, uh, sorry, deliver you two pizzas from Papa John's for 10,000 bitcoins. The transaction was recorded on the blockchain. At the height of the blockchain craziness, this was 197 million US dollars. So Papa John's pizza isn't that great. It surely isn't worth 197 million dollars. I hope that the kid who like, delivered the pizza had a good, fat payday. And then something interesting happened. So, um, this is, just came out in the US. Um, one in, uh, in five students uh, invest their student loans into uh, cryptocurrencies. So probably not the smartest way for a lot of people to uh, invest your money. Um, cryptocurrencies also are really, really, really abundant. So there is Bitcoin, which we probably know of. There's a cryptocurrency called Ether, which a lot of people know. That's the, the cryptocurrency which is tied to Ethereum. But there's more than about 2,000 of those cryptocurrencies. This is a cryptocurrency exchange where you can see all of them listed. So there's a ton of these cryptocurrencies. And the reason why we have so many is because the source code, the code which drives the cryptocurrency is open source. I can take a copy of it and can just create my own coin. If DWS wants to create their own coin, they can create the DWS coin just by copying the code and going out to you and uh, convincing you that it's a great idea to buy this coin. They're also incredibly volatile. Um, this is one of the, the better currencies. It's called Golem. This is a single-day trade, 60% volatility in the single-day trade. So if you were to buy that coin in the morning and sell it in the evening, you would have made 60% um, uh, upside. Trading volume on this day was 355 million US dollars. It's not a small trade. Um, and if you ask yourself, what is this coin actually about? Um, Golem is building a, um, a distributed cloud computer, basically, like an Amazon web service, uh, which is distributed out to many, many other things. This is pretty wild. It gets worse. Um, there is a coin which you can buy called the Dodge coin. The Dodge coin was created based on an internet meme. There's a meme, you know this, you're laughing. There's an internet meme called the Dodge. Um, this guy here, or this, this dog here, is a Shibi, Shibu Uya, or something like this. It's a, uh, it's a Japanese dog. And the owner of the dog took this picture, put it on the internet, and then the internet thought it was really funny. So they started doing, you know, photoshopping this picture into all kinds of pictures. A kid on the internet said, oh, this is really funny. I'm creating a coin in memory of this meme, of the dodge and create a Dogecoin. And literally, when you go to the website for Dogecoin, you can buy Dogecoin today. When you go to the website of Dogecoin, it says, this coin has no value whatsoever. Do not buy this. I just created this as a joke. Well, Dogecoin's market cap topped out at 2 billion US dollars. It's currently at about 750 million dollars. And God knows, I hope that kid is, is, is cashing in on this. It's a wild world. And then something other happens is there's a company called the Long Island Iced Tea Company. They're making literally iced tea. And one day they wake up and they rebrand themselves into the Long Blockchain Corporation. And their stock price goes up 6x, six times stock price increase by simple fact of name change. They didn't even tell people what they were doing. They literally said, like, we're going and buying some 
uh, servers and we do some crypto mining, but we don't kind of know what we're actually doing, six times stock price up. Here's the important thing. A lot of people think that crypto assets, particularly cryptocurrencies, is something we trade in because it's a currency, right, after all. Well, actually, that's not true. So the amount of transactions in Bitcoin is minuscule for a good reason. Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network, tops out at 420 transactions per minute. It's tiny, like Bitcoin is actually not made to transact by sheer virtue of the way the code is written. So there's only about 200,000 Bitcoin transactions every single day, which is tiny if you compare this to a Visa, a MasterCard, or any other trading platform. It's also really expensive to trade in, in Bitcoin. The average price per transaction on a Bitcoin is 60 US dollars. It cost me pennies to transact on the Visa or MasterCard network. On Bitcoin, it's $60, which leads to stuff like this. There's a major Bitcoin conference. This was kind of like uh, one of the, the jokes um, recently. And they accepted, of course, they needed to accept Bitcoin for people to buy the ticket. And they switched it off. They said, like, it's too expensive and takes us too long to process the, uh, the transaction. Because the math behind validating a Bitcoin transaction, I mentioned to you there's a cryptography involved, is so intense, it takes us the energy uh, consumption of a full household for one week to transact a single Bitcoin transaction. The Bitcoin network is now one of the largest energy consumers in the world, which is uh, totally bizarre. And then you've got this other issue, which is, if you can't transact in Bitcoin, you still need to transact in fiat, right? You need to transact in euros and US dollars. So what you need to do is, you need to take your fiat currency, transact it into Bitcoin, and then do whatever you want to do in Bitcoin. And then you need to transact it out of fiat currency, which is a massive issue. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff which is truly just plain problematic. Just watch this video. This is a um, promotion video for an ICO, an initial coin offering, which at best can be described as a Ponzi scheme. These guys raised $660 million on a video which is an obvious Ponzi scheme. Right? And then, of course, what they did is they took all the money, converted it back into fiat currency because you're smart, and then just disappeared. They're also unregulated, right? Like the SEC currently, um, as well as BaFin, et cetera, hasn't fully regulated these things. So that creates really interesting behaviors. There's a currency called Tether. So Tether's claim is that for every Tether coin, they have a US dollar in store. So basically, it's kind of like the gold standard type of idea. Now, Tether's market cap is 2 billion US dollars at the moment, which I can guarantee you they will not have 2 billion US dollars in store somewhere. Um, so we're creating what was, uh, back in the US, you might remember the wildcat banks, like where we had unregulated banking and banking. We just created currency without any value store behind it. And then there's an interesting challenge, which is when you go into the world of smart contracts, what happens with the smart contract is because the smart contract, remember the blockchain is immutable. I can't change the blockchain. What this also means is that when I do a smart contract and I put it onto the blockchain, I cannot change the software. So if you have a bug in that, in that software, I can exploit that bug. These become million dollar bug bounties for people to exploit these bugs because it's really hard to fix those. It's, a set, it's like there's people who tell you that the decentralized nature of smart contracts will become unmeasurable and uncontrollable risks. And then lastly, there's something called the 50% fallacy. So the idea is, you remember, we talked about the idea of a consensus algorithm, right? A, a transaction on the blockchain needs to be validated by, at least in the case of Bitcoin, by 50% of the computers which are part of this network. Now, if I control 50% of those computers, I can validate any transaction. That's a dangerous position, particularly if you're in blockchain situations where there isn't all that many computers. I'll give you an, an interesting insight. If you hold Bitcoin today, the vast amount of computers on the Bitcoin network which validate those transactions, called miners, are controlled by three Chinese companies. We'll see. So, with all that being said,
Let me tell you why I'm incredibly optimistic about this whole space, because I believe it will disrupt, deeply disrupt the way we do our businesses in many areas. Remember, these are these five properties which are really important about the blockchain. And where those make a difference, we will see disruption. And I want to talk about what I call the Magnificent Seven. Seven areas where we'll see blockchain doing really interesting stuff. The first is, we talked about this, we eliminate trust. If you run a notary today, I believe your business will be gone tomorrow. Because we don't need you anymore. I don't need the trust. If you have a business where you make money on establishing and documenting trust, I replace you with a public trust ledger. If you think about stuff like titles, land titles, particularly uh, in emerging economies, in emerging economies in some countries, we've got 80% of land titles are not recorded. The moment I establish a system which is unfudgeable and is public, I solve for this problem. The country of Georgia just currently converted all their land title database onto the blockchain for this particular reason. Um, there's a startup called Harbor which takes physical assets and puts them on the blockchain in exactly this way. So think about if you're in asset management today, if you're managing physical infrastructure, uh, buildings, physical infrastructure, you know, etc., you will use, very most likely, you will use the blockchain to manage those buildings going forward. Also, we will start digitizing and making use of assets. Here's an interesting challenge. If you have a Kindle today, if I buy a book on the Kindle, I cannot borrow this book to you. For a simple reason, of course, because it's digital. If I were to borrow it to you, I give you a copy, and Amazon has no way to tell if that copy is a copy or an original. I can lend my book to all of you, at the same time, the moment I put it into a digital asset, I tokenize it, I have full control over this, and it will revolutionize the way we think about assets, digital assets. Um, there is a competitor site to YouTube called DTube, which started to doing this. So a lot of people who make money on YouTube today by advertising flock to DTube, where they can go out and say, I give you this video, but for you to watch that video, you need to do a little micropayment using a, um, a coin-based um, system. Probably the biggest disrupt that we will see in, very, in the very short term is supply chains. Uh, you might have heard that Walmart just uh, started trying out blockchain literally this morning, yesterday night, last night when I was on the way here to Berlin. I read an article from um, Walmart that they're now expanding this pilot to most of their supply chain. Walmart started this out with uh, mangoes. They could now tell using the blockchain throughout their supply chain. So effectively, when you have a farmer, they start like they put the crate of mangoes somewhere and record it on this private blockchain at, at um, Walmart. And then it goes to the middleman and it goes to the shipper, etc. And every single time you add a transaction to the blockchain and you have full transparency. What they now can tell you for each of these mangoes within two seconds is where the mango came from not just where it came from, literally from which farm, when it was harvested, etc. This took them six days before. Think about what this means for product recalls. If you do a product recall, they can literally go out and say, this crate of mangoes is the one we need to pull out of the, sh the shelf, instead of all the mangoes we have in every single store. There's an interesting challenge. If you're drinking cold-pressed olive oil today, there's a, there's a well-known fact. 50%, sorry, sorry, there is two times more cold-pressed olive oil being sold than there is produced in the world. So if you, do, if you spend a lot of money on cold-pressed olive oil, like there's a really good chance that what you're getting there is not cold-pressed olive oil. Co the blockchain will solve for this. Smart contracts. So we talked about smart contracts. Smart contracts are actually really interesting in a machine-to-machine -machine transaction. In the future, when you get into your Tesla and you find yourself in a traffic jam like this and you need to get to the airport, your Tesla will negotiate with the car in front of you to pull over and let you go through digitally. Seriously, this is going to happen. And then what happens is they establish a digital contract and by the moment your car pu pulls over, like the contract gets fulfilled and your car does a micropayment to my car for letting you through. So we'll see these machine-machine interactions based on the blockchain. Currencies will actually happen. Um, Venezuela launched a currency called the Petro, which is built on their, uh, on their oil reserves. Probably not a good idea to invest into. But a new currency came up called Basis. Um, this is a cryptocurrency 
where they use an algorithmic central bank to stabilize the currency. So they use an AI. We heard this earlier in, this, in the session. Right? They use an AI to simulate a central bank to, to uh, manipulate supply and demand. And trading will become really interesting. If you haven't heard of Numerai, I think you really want to freak out. So what Numerai does is, this is a bunch of data scientists. They are in the business of hedge funds. And what they saw is, most hedge funds, all hedge funds, have probably 20 data scientists. If you're really crazy, you've got probably 50 data scientists. What they did is, they found a way to take the information hedge funds operate on and anonymize it. And then they give these, these data sets to a group of data scientists and say, find local optima in these data sets and then report them back to us and we execute trades based on this. And as an as a, uh, incentive, we, make, we give you a crypto asset which basically has you participate in the upside you're creating. They now already, they're just launched. They have 4,000 of the world's best data scientists hacking on these data sets. This is crazy. Like, there's no hedge fund who has got as many data scientists working for them. It's a really interesting world we're moving into, and everything is changing. So the question for you should be, what, how, how do you use this? What, is, what does it mean? If you want to use blockchain in your company, I think these are the questions you want to ask yourself. So the question is, like, is blockchain actually the right mechanism? It's not the hail all. There's a good chunk of systems where centralized systems makes way more sense. And then you need to figure out, like, what are the scenarios? Who are the players? Whom can you operate with? Blockchain as a system requires an ecosystem. It only makes sense if you're doing this with many other players. If you want to invest into blockchain, you know, a crypto asset or something, you should ask yourself if the, if the thing you're investing into has answered those questions. And make no mistake, we're really, really early. This is like the internet in the 1995s. Like everything, like we're so early, so it's just clear that we're, like everything is crazy at the moment. We're starting to see some standardized efforts. So there's something called R3, which comes out of IBM, um, which is a blockchain standard. Um, so it's easier for us to build products. There's something called Hyperledger, uh, which, makes, uh, which is a similar and competing effort. Um, we are also solving a lot of the problems in the blockchain using new algorithms. Um, IOTA, um, uh, which, is a, which is a company in this space, uses a, this new type of algorithm. Uh, if you ever want to see like, a, a really weird guy explain this to you, go to YouTube, you'll find it. Um, let me close with a last thought. Hemingway wrote in uh, The Sun Always Rises a really interesting quote, and it said, how did you get bankrupt, Sam asks Bill. Two ways, Bill responds. Gradually and then suddenly. And I think this is what we're seeing in technology. Technology moves on this weird line, which is gradually and then suddenly it, it takes off. I've seen this over and over again in every technology we've ever covered. And I think the same is true for uh, blockchain and crypto assets. It, we're clearly in the gradual phase. It's still like early days and it's crazy and weird, but it will come and it will come pretty hard. So with that, I'm at the end of my time. I'm at the end of my session. Thank you so much. And I think we'll have a little bit of time for uh, a, a Q&A session later, right? Right on. Thank you, Pascal. What a 101, I have to say. Are you teaching a course on this anytime soon? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yes. At the uh, Singularity yes, University? Yes, at Singularity, yes. Very cool. And so um, just a quick question. I think so many questions, but if, you know, I think a lot of, and I come from Zurich, from Switzerland, and what I understand from especially the banking world is privacy is everything. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly we have this world which is all about openness. You mentioned it with Numerai. Um, the reason they are powerful is because they're open. Yeah. So how do you feel about, or what is your advice to banks that want to take sort of the first steps balancing, on one hand, their whole legacy that is so much based on privacy, and at the same time realizing that in order to move into the future, you need to be, in some ways, absolutely more open? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. So I think there's, um, there's two aspects, particularly when you look at the blockchain um, to this. The one is there's a whole part around the, the back office. Right? And I highly recommend you work with your technology vendor of choice to figure out how can you leverage blockchain in the back office to get to efficiency gains. Um, on the bus this morning, I read an article that BBVA, I believe, is a bank, 
Um, they just did the first $80 million loan completely transacted on the blockchain. And they said that cu it cut down the, the loan process from weeks to two days. Right? So that's a, that's a very concrete step, which is not scary. It's just like an, a, a classic upgrading of your backend infrastructure. I think the second part is, and the, the speaker before me made that point very, very uh, clearly, is figuring out like, where does banking go? and where does asset management go, et cetera, and figuring out how can you leverage um, blockchain for that. And I think I, I absolutely concur. You need to go back to first principles and figure out like, what does your customer actually want, and then create that product. Mm -hmm.